Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Markus Rudolf from WHO Otto Weissam School of Management. Um, and the, today's topic is um, on an asset pricing issue, namely how to derive the most important asset pricing models out of the stochastic discount factor approach. What you can see here in my back is basically um, a diagram which shows all important um, asset pricing models that we have in the neoclassical theory. Uh, among them, option pricing, state preference pricing, going back to Arrow and De Bruy, um, term structure models, um, and represented, for instance, by Heath, Jerome, Morton. Uh, we have um, the consumption cap M by Breeden. We have the capital asset pricing model by Sharp, Lindner, and Mosser. Um, and we have the intertemporal capital asset pricing model, which has been developed by Bob Merton in the year 1973. So what I would like to show you today is that we typically are distinguishing between no arbitrage models, which are here indicated in blue boxes, and equilibrium models, which are indicated here in red boxes. And then we have two models in between, namely the arbitrage pricing theory, which goes back to Stephen Ross, um, and portfolio theory, which goes back to Harry Markowitz, those are two types of models which are neither no arbitrage models nor equilibrium models. And um, if you look at, look at the history of asset pricing, what you then see is that um, typically we are distinguishing those two paths to asset pricing, no arbitrage models and equilibrium models. The rationale between no arbitrage models is that you try to find a portfolio of assets which replicates the cash flow stream of the asset that you would like to evaluate. So, for instance, if you're talking about a call option, um, then uh, we don't know the price of the call option, but what we do know is what the price of a replicating portfolio is consisting of a short position in bonds and a long position in stocks. So, no arbitrage pricing simply means you evaluate the value of the replicating portfolio and then you deduct the price of the call option out of that replicating portfolio based on the law of one price. And the law of one price simply states that if you have um, two assets or two portfolios which reveal exactly the same payoff pattern, then they must exactly have the same price. Now, in distinction to no arbitrage models, equilibrium models are based on a situation where the demand side and the supply side um, on the market is perfectly cleared. So basically, we don't have any distinction, we don't have, don't have any difference between the demand for assets and the supply of assets. Uh, that requires, of course, to aggregate um, all of the supply preference functions and all of the demand preference functions. So in other words, we need to know the utility functions of suppliers and demanders, and then we equalize them and get a market clearing price, which is called an equilibrium situation. This equilibrium situation is a situation which is lasting typically for only a couple of seconds until a new information occurs. Uh, but within that uh, couple of seconds, it is so that nobody has an incentive neither to buy nor to sell. So basically we have the market in an equilibrium situation where everybody is satisfied with his or her portfolio composition. Now, traditionally, uh, the viewpoint was that no equilibrium, um, that no arbitrage models and equilibrium models are absolutely distinctive approaches. However, in the end, it is absolutely clear that a no, that a no arbitrage situation is an equilibrium situation, and it's also clear that an equilibrium situation cannot be a situation where we do have some arbitrage. So therefore, there must be an equivalence between no arbitrage models and equilibrium models. And until the late 90s of the last century, basically this equivalence was not covered in the literature. We then um, had an approach which is, which is called the stochastic discount factor approach, which you find here in the middle. The stochastic discount factor approach is based on the so-called Euler equation. And this Euler equation basically brings together no arbitrage models and equilibrium models. And um, this, basically this approach, this stochastic discount factor approach, for the first time was really addressed um, in a um, didactically very nice way um, in a textbook published by John Cochrane in the year 2000. So since then, basically, it is so that asset pricing is taught based on the equivalence of no arbitrage models and equilibrium models, and it's not anymore two different streams which lead to 
the asset pricing model that we would like to derive. Now, in order to show you um, how the stochastic discount factor approach works, I would like to derive uh, the capital asset pricing model as well as the consumption capital asset pricing model as an example out of the Euler equation based on the two formulas which you see here on that slide. So the basic rationale of the stochastic discount factor approach is that the price on any asset S is equal to the expected value of any cash flow X which is taking place at the maturity date of that asset discounted with a stochastic discount factor. So the stochastic discount factor approach simply postulates that it is always possible to find an appropriate discount factor such that the price of the asset today is equal to the expected value of the asset in the future discounted by the appropriate discount factor M. Now the trick and the basic thing which is very important here is that the expected value is calculated not, 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 not under a specific probability measure but under any probability measure. So in other words, the stochastic, the stochastic discount factor approach simply states that the value of an asset is equal to the expected value of the asset in the future discounted by the discount rate M under the probability measure pi. And um, the difficult thing in order to identify an asset pricing model is to identify the discount factor and um, the, pro the probability measure under which the cash flow is evaluated. So in other words, any asset pricing model can be derived out of the stochastic discount factor approach if you are only able to identify the appropriate M and to identify the appropriate pi. And that is now something that we would like to do in the context of the capital asset pricing model, which is going to be done on the next slide. So we are again starting with the Euler equation, where S is the price of the asset today, for instance, the price of the stock. M is the stochastic discount factor which we are looking for. X is the cash flow of the stock um, one period later and pi is the probability measure under which we evaluate that asset. Our goal is now to identify a pi and an m such that the capital asset pricing model is the, is the result of the analysis. Now, in order to do that, the first thing that we are doing is we are dividing uh, the Euler equation by st, where st is the stock price today. When we get that, then we obtain something which we call 1 plus r, 1 plus r is simply x divided by s. So 1 plus r is 1 plus the rate of return, where x is the cash flow in the future and s is the price today. So in other words, that is 1 plus the return, which is a stochastic figure. Um, at the same time, we keep, of course, the stochastic discount factor. And if, if we divide the whole equation by s, then we obtain a 1 on the left-hand side. So that is nothing else but a simple rearrangement of the Euler equation. Um, what we now have to do is we have to identify a discount rate such that the cap consumption capital asset pricing model of uh, Douglas Breed in 1979, respectively the capital asset pricing model of Bill Sharp 1964 comes out. Now what the stochastic discount factor um, postulates is that there is always a discount factor which we can find such that the specific model can be derived. Therefore, assume that our discount factor would be defined by this equation. The discount factor M is equal to the marginal utility of future consumption divided by the marginal utility of today's consumption. So U prime of CT is the marginal utility of future consumption. U is the utility function. U prime is the first derivative of the utility function. So economically, the marginal utility. And C little t is the consumption today. U prime, again, is the first derivative. So therefore, this is, so to say, the marginal rate of substitution between today's and tomorrow's consumption. That is something which you very often have in neoclassical models going back to Fisher and Hirschleifer. Um, and we basically choose this as our discount factor M, which, by the way, is stochastic, simply because C 
capital T is stochastic. C capital T is the consumption in the future. We don't know today what the consumption in the future is going to be. Now what we are now doing is we are plugging in this stochastic discount factor here. And we obtain then 1 is equal to the expected value of the stochastic discount factor, which is the marginal rate of substitution, times 1 plus r, which comes from here. At the same time, we have to identify a probability measure under which we are evaluating this expected value. And what we do is we choose the probability measure p. p is the empirical probability measure. And under this probability measure, we would like to show that based on this discount factor, namely the marginal rate of substitution of consumption, we are able to derive the consumption capital as a pricing model. If we wanted to derive the Black and Scholes model, for instance, instead, then we would have to select a different discount factor and a different probability measure. The Black and Scholes model, for instance, is derived under the risk-neutral probability measure, but here we are operating under the um, empirical probability measure called P. Now, if you rearrange terms a little bit, what we then can say is that, um, we, that the expected value of two random variables is simply equal to the, to, the, um, to, the, is equal to the multiplication of the expected values of each of the random variables plus the covariance between the two random variables. So in other words, we have this equals the expected value of the marginal rate of substitution of consumption plus uh, times 1 plus the expected value of r, which we here identify by mu. Mu is the expected return, that is the expected value of r, under the empirical probability measure p, plus the covariance between the marginal rate of substitution and the return. So in other words, this is a rearrangement of terms, and now, now we need another slide in order to be able to derive the consumption capital less surprising model. So, the equation that we have derived on the previous slide holds for any asset with a return R. In particular, of course, it holds also for the riskless asset. The riskless asset has a return little r. Little r is the return of the riskless asset. And of course, if our stochastic discount factor equation holds for any asset, it holds in particular also for the riskless asset. Now what I'm now doing is I'm applying the equation to the riskless asset. So in other words, we have 1 equals the expected value under the empirical probability measure P of the marginal rate of substitution of consumption times 1 plus little r. Little r, again, is the rate of return of the, on the riskless asset. So what I'm now doing is I'm again um, subdividing this expression um, in terms of the covariance expression that we have seen before. However, if we have a riskless asset which is called R, we don't have any covariance with any other asset simply because R is riskless. Anything which is riskless does neither have a variance nor does it have a covariance. And therefore what we see here is we see an expression without any covariance expression simply because R reveals a covariance of zero with any other asset. So what we now can derive is that we can derive from that that the, that the expected value of the marginal rate of substitution is nothing else but 1 divided by 1 plus r. So that gives us now the opportunity to substitute in the expected value of the marginal rate of substitution into the equation of the previous slide. So we obtain this equation here by substituting in 1 divided by 1 plus r for the expected value of the marginal rate of substitution of consumption and that is taking place here in this equation. The rest remains to be the same, namely it's exactly the covariance expression. Now, in order to reformulate the covariance part of the stochastic discount factor equation, we need to apply something which is called Stein's lemma. Stein's lemma applies to any two random variables which are jointly normally distributed. Now assume here, assume we have two equations x and y and those equations x and y are jointly normally distributed. 
What Stein's lemma says is, if you have a covariance of f of x with y, then you can reformulate it and say, this is the same like the expected value of f prime of f of f prime of x times the covariance of x with y. Now, by applying the Stein's lemma, we can get rid of the functional expression f here and obtain the pure covariance between the two random variables, x and y. Um, a prerequisite for the application of the Stein's lemma is that x and y are jointly normally distributed. So therefore, if we apply Stein's lemma to our stochastic disk confactor equation, what we need to assume is that ct and r are jointly normally distributed. This is a very reasonable and very usual um, neoclassical assumption, namely that stock market returns and consumption is normally distributed, and we do assume that here. So what we are now doing is, we are now applying Stein's lemma here to that equation. Now, the first part is exactly the same. In the second part, um, in the second part we are simply reformulating the u prime of ct by a u double prime of ct and um, apply the expected value operator to that. This is exactly equivalent to what Stein's lemma suggests us to do. Um, only that the f function here is the u prime function and that the x variable is the c capital T variable. So in other words, if you substitute f by u prime and x by c capital T, then this is the direct application of Stein's lemma to this equation here. What we have here is sigma cr and sigma cr is the covariance between c and r, is the covariance between consumption and stock market returns. Um, so that's exactly what we have here. So therefore, a reformulation of the stochastic disk factor approach in this way allows us now to formulate it like you see it here, implying namely a covariance expression between stock markets and consumption. Now, if we go back to the equation of the previous slide, which you find here, 1 equals 1 plus mu divided by 1 plus r, plus the expected value of u double prime under the empirical measure p divided by u single prime times sigma cr, which is the covariance between um, a stock and consumption. This is the equation that we have had. This equation holds again for any asset. In particular, of course, it holds also for the market portfolio, the market portfolio M. The market portfolio is the capitalization weighted portfolio consisting of all assets. This is the portfolio which is quite central in the capital asset pricing model. So what we are now doing is we are applying it to M. So then we have mu M here, which is the expected return on the market portfolio. And we have also sigma CM here, because we have not any stock with a return R, we have a particular stock market portfolio with an expected return Rm. So therefore, we substitute simply the Rs by the Ms. That's the first step that we do. Then we multiply the whole equation by 1 plus R. If we multiply the whole equation by 1 plus R and then rearrange terms, then we obtain mu M minus R is equal to this expression here, of course, with a negative sign because we put it on the other side of the equation. So that's minus what we have here times 1 plus r, with which we have multiplied, times sigma cm, which um, comes from the fact that we have substituted any r by an m, because we are talking about the market portfolio right now. So once we have that, we can rearrange terms again and can say we put the sigma cm on the other side of the equation and obtain the market price of consumption risk here. So that's the market price of consumption risk um, if we talk about the market portfolio. However, exactly the same equation would have occurred if we wouldn't have used the market portfolio, but if we would have used any other stock market portfolio with the return R. So in other words, this market price of consumption risk is the same for the market portfolio and for any other stock which is traded at the market. So therefore we can say this market price of consumption risk is the same like this market price of consumption risk. Namely, it's always equal, namely it's always equal to A 
and A is, um, and A is simply um, the expected value of U double prime negative sign divided by U prime times 1 plus R. Now this expression here, namely A, um, deserves a closer look because if you have an expression which is minus the expected value of the second derivative divided by the first derivative, this is a concept which is very well known um, in, based on the first bachelor course that you have in financial market theory, namely it's called the Aeropret measure of um, relative risk aversion. This is the Aeropret measure of relative risk aversion. So in fact, this A here is the Aeropret measure. And what we find is that the Aeropret measure is equal to um, the market price of consumption risk for the market portfolio, but it's also equal to the price of consumption risk of any, of any other stock. So that means, um, that means the market price of risk, of consumption risk, for any stock is the same. Namely, equal to the, the, to the amount of relative risk aversion. The more risk averse people are, the higher is the expected premium that people are expecting for consumption risk. This is what this, what this equation here states. The higher um, the risk aversion is, the more people are expecting a premium for consumption covariance risk. Now, if you take this and rearrange terms, what we then find is that mu r minus r, minus r is exactly the same um, is exactly the same like a times sigma cr, a times sigma cr, or if we substitute in um, the a, we can also say mu m minus r divided by sigma cm, which you find here, equals mu r minus r divided by sigma cr, which you find here. And what we then obtain is that mu r minus r is here is equal to mu m minus r, which you find here, times sigma cr divided by sigma cm. And that here, by the way, is the consumption capital asset pricing model, going back to Breeden 1979. What we have here, this is, so to say, the consumption beta. This is the covariance between consumption and the asset return divided by uh, the covariance between consumption and the market return. This is what we call the consumption beta. This is what we call the consumption beta. So that is, that is uh, the consumption cap M derived by Breeden, which is much more general than the classical capital asset pricing model because it refers stock market returns to consumption in general. The difference between the consumption capital asset pricing model and the classical capital asset pricing model is that the classical capital asset pricing model assumes that there is just one market portfolio and this single market portfolio is covering all assets which there are on the market, implying stocks, bonds, domestic assets, foreign assets, currencies, commodities, even things like real estate, human capital, and many other asset categories. So in other words, um, the uh, much more narrow assumption on which the capital asset pricing model is based is that consumption always comes out of something which is called the market portfolio. Breeden's consumption cap M, however, assumes that consumption is coming from anywhere, not necessarily expressible by a market portfolio. So therefore, the difference between the consumption cap M and the cap M is that the cap M is less general. Namely, in the case of the cap M, we simply have to replace the consumption portfolio by the market portfolio. Um, in other words, we simply have to replace um, the C by an M. So if you replace the C by an M, then we obtain sigma MR here and sigma MM here. Now, sigma mm is obviously the variance of the market. Sigma mr is obviously the covariance between the asset and the market. And this, what you have here, is quite clearly the beta of the asset with return r of on the market portfolio. So here, this is the beta. This is the respective beta. And what you find here then is the equation of the capital asset pricing model. The excess return on any asset r, mu r minus r, is equal to the excess return on the market times beta. So that's the cap m, that's the consumption cap m. Both have been derived out of the stochastic discount factor approach, which simply shows that 
Those two equilibrium models can be derived out of the STF approach. What you also can do is you can also derive um, no arbitrage models, like for instance the Black and Scholes model out of the stochastic discount factor approach. If you are able to prove that, then you can um, prove the equivalence between no arbitrage models and equilibrium models, but this is subject to another derivation on this channel.